Welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome to the, uh, the, the circle uh, panel discussion on India 2047. Uh, it's, uh, it's great that you could all join. I hope everybody is, is well, um, uh, wherever you, uh, you are. Uh, my name is, uh, is Ariel Nahan. I currently work at the, and I've worked for 10 years at Canada's International Development Research Center. Uh, and, and, uh, and thank you, Sharda and, and uh, University of Guelph uh, and Circle to uh, invite me to moderate this event for, uh, for, for you. It's my great pleasure and, and honor. Uh, I'm based in, in Ottawa. Uh, like I said, I work for IRC, based in Ottawa, which is uh, on the unceded territory. And I speak from, to you from the unceded the territory of the Algonquin peoples. Uh, this event on India 2047 is hosted by uh, Circle at the University of, of Guelph. Uh, Circle was uh, established uh, in, in February 2020. Uh, Circle is the Canada India Research Center for Learning and Engagement. And, and, and I think uh, uh, Sharda Srinivasan and colleagues have done a tremendous job to, to renew the interest in working on and working uh, with, uh, with, China, China, uh, with, with, with India out of, out of Canada. Um, and, and so Circle aims to be an interdisciplinary nucleus uh, for cutting uh, research on India, uh, on and with the Indian diaspora to showcase advocates uh, and ca catalyze a, a foster an equitable, respectful, and sustained exchange of knowledge between Canadian and Indian scholars. And again, it's, it's such a privilege to, to, to be part of this and hosting this event uh, for you. Um, before I tell you uh, what the event is about and introduce the fantastic panel that we have, a few uh, logistical comments. I, I think everybody after 19 months, 19 months is very familiar with how Zoom meetings work, but, uh, but, but let me go through them. Nonetheless, um, uh, of course, we, we tried to establish a respectful and, uh, platform here where everybody has an opportunity to share ideas. Uh, and with that, to, to facilitate the logistics, please make sure that you remain on mute. I, I understand that everybody has the opportunity to open the mic, and that may come, uh, you, you have the opportunity later, but please, uh, uh, stay on mute and please for the interest of clear pictures and so on uh, keep the video uh, off and we will come to the, the q a uh, session uh, after the three presentations of course in the meantime there is a chat function of course where you can post your questions throughout or uh, to the end and, and at the end of uh, in the q a session i will either take uh, uh, interventions by by people um or, or or read out the questions that you've posed. Please do put your questions in the Q and in the chat function rather at any point of time, and I will read those uh, those out. Um, the event is being uh, recorded uh, so that it, uh, we hope it can be made available later with time zones and all and availability of people is, is a great opportunity and and in by uh, participating uh, we understand that you agree that this will be uh, will be recorded so that's it for for the logistics there's the chat function in case you have questions concerns do let us uh, know um the uh Topic of today is and of the series is uh, is India 2047. Uh, we are at the 75th uh, uh, birthday of India as a as, as a nation, and this is a great time to think about what the last 75 or 25 years have have looked like, and what the 20, next 25 years uh, may have looked like. India, of course has been uh, since independence at the forefront of a development model of a democratic nation that has promoted economic growth and human development, probably not as fast as, as many would, would, uh, would aspire. Inequalities have remained uh, large, but it has had that distinct development uh, model. Um, of course, the pandemic has has thrown has thrown up many many questions. India has been particularly uh, badly uh, badly affected, and then again, that's an important moment to reflect on what this means for 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 its development model and what's happening, uh, what may be happening, what visions exist for the next 25, uh, 25 years. Um, 
uh, and and of course in and and I know many of the speakers will will come to that of course the last uh, the last decade or so also many questions about its its political system its its, its systems of governance and democracy there's many many issues that 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 have come up the global environment has changed many questions have come up uh, against what the the, the original uh, of course what the, the the original plans were so so we've got three fantastic speakers to uh, to 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 think with us uh, about this about uh, where india is at at that uh, that 75 years mark and what the vision is for for, for the next 25 years and and it's my my great uh, privilege to to start i will introduce all the speakers uh, but i'll i'll do that when they start speaking uh, rather than uh, than at the beginning uh, and 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 our first speaker uh, of today uh, and and it's uh, thank you so much amit for for joining us is Amitabh Behar, who is currently the uh, Amitabh is currently the chief executive officer at Oxfam India. He's also the president of Yuva. Amitabh, in your introduction, feel free to say anything about the role as it's relevant to this topic, of course. Uh, and his dedication has been throughout his career to promoting strong, stronger governance and civil society and uh, in India and globally. He is, he's he's advocating for that in his current role and also has written uh, written about this e extensively. So again, uh, Amitabh is a great honor that you can uh, you could join that you can join us that you kick off this debate and we'd love to hear look forward to hear about your vision for as we said you know the, the vision for india for the next uh, for the next 25 years um all the speakers have uh, have 15 minutes and and i i will try to keep us to time in to, in the interest of uh having a good discussion at the end of the three uh, the three contributions amita thank you so much over to you Thank you, Arhan, and, and thank you, uh, Sharda, for inviting me. I'm, I, I must say that I'm really delighted to be part of this conversation, uh, though I'm not very sure if this is a good moment to talk about 2047. Uh, it is a fa fairly gloomy moment, and I do not have much optimism to offer, uh, but, but that's how the story is. So, uh, let me still try and do this in two parts. The first is to try and talk about how do I look at in India at the moment and what could be the possible pathways for a more optimistic future. Uh, but, but the silver lining is probably what we heard three days ago in terms of the announcement of the repeal of the farm laws. It does tell us that people's power still works and Indian democracy still has uh, some teeth uh, left in it. So, so just wanted to start with that. But I was saying it's, it's really a pessimistic time because um, uh, I did lose uh, not one, two friends during COVID second wave, waiting for just an oxygen cylinder uh, at the reception of uh, uh, hospitals. Uh, we also, everybody saw those very, very, uh, you know, tragic pictures of dead bodies floating uh, in, in, uh, in Ganga. So, so that's, that's the context. But le let me just say that COVID obviously was external, but the health system is something that we have created. And what we saw was, was a, a health system which was completely crumbling. Remarkable work done by the paramedics, the nurses, the doctors, but the health system was certainly completely, it had collapsed. And, you know, just, just to give you this, this picture, why I say I'm, I'm fairly down and, and um, pretty much heart, heartbroken with this experience, but, but also with what's happening. Let me give you just one data point on this, that in India, in 2010, we had 10 beds per thousand uh, in Indian hospitals, which has actually come down, according to the HDR, to five beds per thousand in 2020. So you're actually looking at shrinking of the uh, health system. And that's, that's something that we have done through our uh, policy design. Let me just, you know, talk of a couple of things for, for an, group of this kind, I'm not going to go into 
a lot of details, but I'm fairly sure everybody knows that uh, one third of the global poor live in this country. One third of the globally malnourished children are in this country. The numbers can be contested. It could be uh, slightly higher. And this grim scenario is happening in a context of growing inequality. And I just want to kind of, you know, flag those, the different faces of inequality that we encounter on a daily basis. And I'll just take you back to uh, our report two years ago, the Oxfam uh, India Inequality Report. And I think, you know, one of those powerful killer stats that we had, which said that literally nine people, nine people and all men, no surprises, had more wealth uh, two years ago than 50% of the Indian population. So that's, that's almost like nine people more wealth than say 650 million people. That's the level of inequality we're looking at. You know, I, I just want to continue building on this inequality piece or by giving you a couple of other examples to talk about the different dimensions and the faces of inequality. A few years ago, I was in Maratwara for, for drought relief. Uh, and, and it was a very, very tiring day, tiring physically, but mentally also exhausting to, to actually see people walk kilometers and kilometers uh, for water, livestock literally dying. <clears throat> and, and then I uh, drove back to Pune and I was supposed to drive back to Mumbai to take a flight. Between Pune and Mumbai, there were hoardings every five kilometers. Mind you, I'm coming from Parbani after this, this uh, tough day. Uh, every five kilometers, there were hoardings uh, talking about flats with independent swimming pools. And there were pictures of, of that. Uh, in Mumbai, flats being sold with um, independent swimming pools. And, and I just couldn't, couldn't uh, you know, take that coming from Parbani and then eventually seeing those. Uh, and this was being advertised uh, in the country. This morning, in fact, I was uh, in, a, in a meeting uh, where we, it, it's, it's a coalition which is called Girls Count and we work on declining child sex ratio. And, and I think it's, it's absolutely devastating that in 2011, we don't have the numbers now, but the last count that we had 2011, we had only 916 girls in zero to six for all for 1000 boys. And as if nature has its way, it should be 1000 for 1005. That's the level of uh, inequality we are seeing in terms of gender, but this is way more tragic. And Amartya Sen talks of the missing millions. So for every 1000, we are missing almost 84 girls for every thousand in a country of 1.3 billion. That's what we're looking at uh, uh, gender. And just to give you one more uh, data point, in 27, I, I also work uh, with a group called uh, Safai Karamchari Andolan, and they work with manual scavengers. And they came out with this devastating report that in 2017, uh, in just the NCR, which is Delhi and, and the satellite uh, towns around Delhi, uh, there were seven deaths every 15 days of uh, people who went inside the gutters of Delhi, just cleaning the sewage lines. And I, I'm particularly highlighting this, you know, the tragedy of losing people is obviously extremely sad, but all these people, every 15 days, seven people dying. They were all from just one particular caste. So the realities of, of the, the gender discrimination, of caste discrimination continue. And in some cases, they've just got amplified. And let me, you know, uh, you know what, what really aches my heart today is the story of what's happening with the Indian Muslims. And the lynchings that we have seen starting from uh, Akhlaq to Junaid to now what we are seeing is a systematic assault, even on the livelihood of Muslims, uh, people who just do small carts uh, and, and who earn daily wages. 
so so that's that's the scenario we are in how do you deal with it you know i'm, I'm trying to now try and look at the brighter side hopefully there is a brighter side but let me just say that i do feel very very worried with what's happening in the country at the moment so it's a tough one to talk of 2047 but let me specifically talk of five things which hopefully can give us uh, a pathway according to me this is a pathway uh, and it's not going to be very very uh, innovative i'm not going to talk of new things if somebody just tells me go back to 20 uh, 1947 and go back to the dreams of 47 I would probably be happy to just take those dreams and work with those dreams. But let me specifically talk of five things that I, I've thought of. The first one, I think we need to have a very serious discussion about the role of the Indian state. We've seen the journey of Indian state from being a, a welfare state to post 91, we heard it had become a regulatory state. But what we are seeing now is a predatory state. We have seen how it is siding with uh, corporate interests, few corporate interests, few individuals, and how it is actually converting public resources into private profits. So the crony capitalism that we're looking at is, is something which has become real and is certainly not going to take us to a just and equal sustainable uh, society. If that's the objective, we need to be going back to the idea of the welfare state. The second, I would say, very real and serious investments uh, in the idea of human rights. And let me say two things on, on this. The first, as in many of us, uh, I certainly know at least Yamini and I have been working on, on economic rights, uh, social rights for a long time. And, and just to give you a, a data on health, because I was talking about health, we have just been investing 1.25% of the GDP on health, which is way below other countries. It's really as most of the other countries uh, actually invest five, seven, nine uh, percent So even in South Asia, we are doing fairly badly in terms of investments in, in public health. Whereas every government, and I think after the AIDS plan, Eighth five-year plan, every government, every political party has promised two to three percent, but we are still not being able to achieve that, which has reflected in what we saw uh, during the COVID second wave. So we certainly need serious investments. We did right to education many years ago, but what we are seeing is there's a study that we do as the right to education platform. Only 12% of uh, Indian schools are right to education compliant. So there's a huge gap in terms of the aspiration of the right to education, the right to health, other socioeconomic rights, but, but we, are, we do not, we have not built the state capacity to deliver these rights. But the second I wanted to say is, which I would have probably not said five years ago, is that many of us also made that mistake of, of uh, uh, focusing on socioeconomic rights and not adequately on social, uh, civil political rights. I think that's, that's critical. We all talk of indivisibility of rights, but we ended up probably naively looking at the discourse of development and kind of forgot the, the civil political rights bit. I think it's absolutely critical that we work on civil political rights in multiple ways. Amnesty has been asked to leave this country, but we need many, many, many more amnesties uh, here at the moment. The third thing that I wanted to say is uh, really just you know going back to the Indian constitution. It is probably one of the most remarkable documents. As in, I, I still feel inspired every time I read the preamble of, of our constitution, every time. I feel uh, inspired. And I, I think we were in 47 experimenting with something uh, really pathbreaking, bringing in justice to the preamble of our constitution, talking about equality as a central idea uh, uh, for, for the new Indian Republic. But our, our uh, last 75 years have been fairly tough in many ways. 
uh, in terms of uh, equality, in terms of justice, and there's much ground to cover, which I certainly feel that in the last six, seven years, we've uh, gone on the reverse path. So, so, so that's, that's a huge worry. But on this, I would say two specific things that we completely forgot to work on the idea of fraternity, which is so central to the idea of Indian constitution and probably any, any democracy. Uh, in political theory, people would probably talk about it, but in reality, we just kind of forgot about it. So the rebuilding has to be done through uh, looking at fraternity also uh, in a very, very serious way. Uh, uh, otherwise, we are looking at um, uh, where we'll have minorities as second-rate citizens, which certainly is not the idea of India. I'm going to accept uh, and, and we'll need to fight for it. The fourth that I, I wanted to say is uh, just moving on to the idea of democracy itself. Uh, Arhan, in his opening comments, talked about it. And yes, you can look at it uh, with uh, in multiple ways. There are many, and I, I have often said that in India, democracy gets reduced to one day of voting. Uh, and, and you do not have really a democratic, uh, democratic systems, processes post that day of voting. Uh, but let me also say, uh, that maybe I'm being very cynical because of the immediate context. Democracy is also delivered in many ways. Uh, when I was growing up, even, you know, that's just in, in say, 80s, I could have never imagined that uh, we would have a Dalit chief minister in Uttar Pradesh, but it did happen. So democracy is also delivered in, in, in some ways, but what we need is uh, a brick by brick building of democracy. It has to be a social democracy. It is substantive democracy. So the procedural and normative democracy that we talked of, it's anyways being eroded with the onslaught of Hindutva, with the onslaught of, of the, the, the new idea of India, which is being talked of. But I think the counter to this is to break, uh, to rebuild democracy brick by brick. And it'll have to start with Gram Sabhas. We'll need a lot of thinking, but I do think that that's, that's critical. And my fifth and final point is uh, that uh, I, I must say that, and, and these are also in some ways the pathways that I'm talking of, I do not have much hope uh, from the mainstream party uh, parties. Uh, so the political system does not inspire confidence, uh, but I do feel that the civil society is gonna be the site of action for the next 25 years. So, so what I talked of, if we're gonna achieve that, the site of action is gonna be civil society. I do understand I come from civil society. I'm very, very critical of how we function. We are splintered. We do lack courage in many, many ways. Uh, but if you still look at the most recent history, the real challenge to the homogenizing Hindutva has come from the civil society. So we've just seen the big victory of the farmers' agitation. I think the NRCCA was another massive milestone. I would even say that the first, if you remember, the first challenge to this authoritarian populist uh, chest thumping uh, prime minister actually came from um, the students. Started from a very small film and television institute went to Banaras, to JNU, to Jamia. So I, I do have uh, a lot of hope and civil society will need to redesign itself. Uh, the Foreign Contribution Regulation Act, et cetera, are gonna be just incidental. They need much more courage and to take on uh, the, the challenge of, of, of this alternative idea of India head on and reestablish, I think our idea of India which was in 1947 relevant, and I think it's still relevant. So I, I do hope that, you know, that in 2047, when Veer Das is speaking, he's not speaking of two Indias, and he's speaking of only one India, the India that Indian constitution talks of, the preamble talks of. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, uh, Amita. Thank, thanks you for, for sharing that with, uh, with us. And, and so sorry to hear about your losses during the pandemic, which, which many, particularly in, 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 in India and elsewhere in the world, have, uh, have suffered and, 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 and important how you connect that to uh, the, 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 the investments in healthcare systems that were, that, that were, uh, were made. One thing that, that comes out very strongly in your presentation. There's already a question about in how inequalities relate to social cultural realities. Is the interconnectedness of the challenges that you raised? The, the, the dream of India was, an, I think, an interconnected set of dream, well, one dream, inter, interconnected issues. And, 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 and there's very clear um, uh, uh, issues in, in, in each of them and how they relate to each other, which makes the discussion very both very hard and very important to have. So I hope we can come back to that. And also thank you for those points of, 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 uh, of mild optimism perhaps and that where changes does happen and where I think you said the democracy still has its, its teeth as we've seen recently. So, so very important to hold on this as well. Um, we quickly move on to, uh, to, to our next, uh, next uh, speaker and, and uh, Amita also already referred to one of the, 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 the challenges of, of, of lack of progress in equalities have been in food security in, in, in India, which I think in the 1970s people would find in the 80s would have found quite unimaginable how, how much of a challenge that would st still be 75 years into independence. So, so for that reason, it, it's great. And thank you so much for joining us, Shuda. Shuda Narayanan is, uh, as, as her bio says, on the, you can read it on the website, passionate about agriculture and food and nutrition policies. She is currently uh, a research fellow um, in, uh, in, in, in the South Asia Regional Office of the International Food Policy Research Institute that previously worked at previously worked at Indira Gandhi Institute, Institute of Economic Growth. So Shuda, over to you. Thank you so much for joining us and, and looking forward to your comments. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen here. Uh, and I also want to begin by saying that uh, uh, if anyone had told me that we would have to look to the agricultural sector to, for optimism, I would have uh, not believed myself. But uh, I, I guess what I'm trying to portray here is uh, uh, a pragmatic view of what we are going to see in the next 20 years, the incredible and formidable challenges that we face, but uh, challenges that are uh, that can be met with a little bit of effort. Uh, so let me start with the future of farming in India. Many people would actually say that this begs the question, is there a future in farming in India? Uh, and what does the scenario look like? Uh, in 2012-13, all of us were quite startled that 41% of the farmers in the nationally representative survey said they would like to exit farming if they had an option. And that same survey actually said that agricultural households were actually earning as much as 40% from our farm sources. 32% of it was via wages. And we, a decade after the 2019 survey that uh, that's very similar to the previous one, says that this uh, share of income has actually increased. So these are agricultural households that depend heavily on our farm sources. Uh, average land holding size is 1.08 hectares, declining over time. And the uh, bulk of them actually have less than one hectare. And uh, the story is this, uh, distressing that if you have... Uh, less than one hectare, your incomes, net incomes barely cover your consumption expenses, let alone making investments or uh, uh, meeting debts. Uh, and 52% of all agricultural households were in debt. And what we find is since the survey in 2012-13, there's not been much improvement. Now you would think that this prompts a huge shift away from farming into other uh, occupations in the non-farm sector. And we do see some declines in the, those who identify themselves as main cultivators. Uh, you do see a little bit of decline uh, in the last decade or two, uh, but not nowhere in comparison to the kind of things we associate with structural transformation. And uh, if you look at the data closely, several of them have actually dispossessed. So they used to own land and were main cultivators, but are no longer, that's no longer the case. So many of them have actually joined the 
labor force uh, as functionally landless or landless workers. Uh, on the other hand, you see agricultural workers, the numbers are still increasing. The share of the population uh, or workforce may be declining, but it's doing so at a very slow pace. Uh, so what does this mean that you still have these large numbers dependent on agriculture, uh, but with the land uh, not actually cultivated land not growing? Uh, and here actually India bucks the global trend. So across the world, uh, outside of South Asia, you see farms becoming larger, farmers fewer, and India bucks the strength of farm consolidation, where you have uh, uh, an increase in the number of small holders uh, and operational holdings. And that trend has been steadily continuing. Now, why has this happened? Because I think this, this is the central issue with where we are headed as we go towards 2047. Uh, we do see a subdivision of land holdings across generations. This is the primary driver of uh, smaller land sizes. And it actually varies across the country, depending on the pace of demographic transitions. We find that states that still have, uh, haven't completed the fertility transition, there's still scope for these land holdings to get further subdivided. Whereas on the other hand, advanced agricultural areas where this transition is over, it's actually stabilized and it's no longer feasible economically to subdivide land further. But historically, in the Indian policy has always been favorable to smallholders. Now, this is debatable in terms of how it's implemented, but overarchingly, if you look at it, there are land ceilings, uh, there are restrictions on the transfer of agricultural land to non-farmers. Uh, many states are now toying with these laws to change those, um, to invite uh, land acquisition by non-farmers. Uh, so all of this is not perfect, but by and large, including the efforts at land reform in some states, uh, policy has been uh, fa has favored small holdings over consolidation. Uh, so that's at the on the farm sector. The other way is why are we not seeing this large scale movement away from agriculture? Simply because exit is not an option. Uh, you still have fifty percent deriving livelihoods from agriculture even though the share of contribution of agriculture to GDP has gone down. And that has to do with the very peculiar nature of structural transformation in India. Uh, there are no, not many routine jobs. Uh, there are precarious livelihoods, poorly paying and poor working conditions. Uh, and then when you look at it historically in other countries, uh, the movement away from land and the disconnect from land comes when there are routine jobs. So that the ties with land are broken. That's not happening in India. It's unlikely to happen. So land continues to be a fallback option. And that was no, uh, no more clearly evident than in the COVID-19 crisis when the return migrants actually went to till the land. So the largest spike in employment we saw was actually in the farming sector. There's also an interesting uh, phenomenon on who farms. And this is work actually I've done with Shaza uh, herself on uh, pathways into farming. And uh, across a lot of regions, especially where the urban non-farm sectors exploded, um, many people associate farming with lower status and manual labor. There are, of course, caste class issues associated with uh, respectability of farming. But at the same time, you see a, in a lot of areas, the previously landless communities and caste are actually, their aspirations are actually to enter farming. So you have this a lot of variation across the um, uh, across the country, but the fundamental thing is going forward to 2047, we are going to see India being a nation of smallholders. Uh, ties with land are not going to get broken so easily. Uh, a complete exit we are not going to see. And as long as there is no drastic change in policy that favors consolidation, something that Amitabh mentioned about crony capitalism, we are going to see, uh, we are going to be a nation of smallholders. Uh, very often, this idea of structural transformation exit from agriculture is also seen as um, accompanied by technology transition. And globally, there is a talk of agriculture 1.0, 2.03, and 4. And uh, basically looking at the different revolutions of agriculture that parallels the industrial revolution, with the industrial revolution, in fact, feeding into changes in agriculture. So I won't talk about this in detail, but essentially it's about settled agriculture, some basic uh, revolution with machinery and chemicals, then post-war increases through seed uh, development and mechanization. Some people extend it to computers and robotics now. 
And then now we are supposedly in what is agriculture for, which is uh, the use of big data analytics, cloud computing, and blockchain. And if you look at the contrast to conversations in India about these transition, essentially there are only two. So there is the first three is called one, and then we have just kind of uh, pole vaulted to four. This is not to say that we are leaving the old behind. It's just that the technology transition in agriculture in India is also very peculiar in the sense that there's coexistence of all of these different regimes of technology and uh, each of it is viewed as something that will solve the agriculture problem and in particular the smallholder problem. And so we now are in a, uh, in a scenario of great optimism that ag tech is going to bring in. But all of that, I, and that's the purpose of uh, the central message that I want to convey is that when, when we think of technology, there are several uh, guiding principles. And in, in the context of India, it has to be smallholder centric and people centric. Um, and technology cannot solve a, a smallholder problem if it doesn't want to sustain. Uh, if, yeah, we want we need to be able to support smallholder agriculture as a social and uh, imperative. Uh, and this agriculture and uh, ag tech and technologies in agriculture cannot seem uh, be viewed to solve the problem by making the smallholders go away. Um, and if you look at the trends in mechanization, it just reinforces what I've been saying. If you look at the last 40 years of uh, transition, uh, draft labor has gone down, but human labor continues to be high. So the mesh mechanization has actually replaced draft animal labor, but not human labor. And so very uh, agriculture continues to be um, a, a, a source of food and employment but it's happening under very complex and diverse conditions that varies across regions. Uh, looming environmental challenges, some of it in fact a consequence of the Green Revolution, poor soils, groundwater, and then there is this looming crisis of climate change threats across the country, again different in different regions. And we are slowly seeing the emergence of consolidation of corporate interests and big business, whether it's in seed, in marketing, and the current ongoing thing is accompanying ag tech, we are going to see a huge digital consolidation. Uh, we already have very contro a lot of controversies around technology, especially with GMO and gene editing technology, and now emergence of agri-tech. And the point I guess I want to emphasize here is that all of these technologies are trying to solve a smallholder problem uh, without explicitly incorporating smallholders as part of who they want to help. Uh, one instance, for example, in the, the emergence of ag tech is that uh, smallholders who either to did not have extension services are now going to be able to access these technologies and improve productivity. At the same time, when you look at the way agri tech is unfolding here, the control is very much, even though there are a lot of small scale startups, uh, it's, it's only a, a transitionary phase where we do anticipate that big business is going to acquire these small players and uh, the reach, the last mile issue of reaching the smallholder is still a problem that remains uh, unresolved. But there are opportunities. The expansion of production, uh, we think of technology as solving the productivity problem, but there's huge scope to also uh, expand on the extensive margin where uh, irrigation penetration in India is still pretty limited. Only 48% is irrigated and only 41% of uh, the areas more than once. Um, so while there is a focus on yield gaps and covering them via technological interventions, very simple old solutions like providing sustainable irrigation uh, is still relevant across many states. Because it's not true of the mature agriculture green revolution areas, but uh, um, other areas, there's still a huge scope. Uh, and those investments are essential, especially as uh, fertile agricultural land uh, is diverted to urban uses. We need uh, more marginal areas come under production and that investment is required. And India's advantage of a huge domestic demand, the problem so far has been uh, that when people say that we need higher productivity to lower prices for the poor, uh, we also have to keep in mind that wage rates haven't increased very much. So as long as wages increase, um, the ability to pay would increase. And so the pressure is not to keep farmer prices down but actually to ensure that incomes overall go up so that uh, food becomes affordable to the uh, 
the people because of their rise in incomes. And today we have moved largely away from a food grain dominated system. In 2018, we saw for the first time horticulture overtaking food grain production. So many of the critiques of the farmer protests as well as the green revolution that there is absence of diversification may be true of specific regions, but not of the country overall. Likewise, milk, poultry, and fish are increasingly becoming important uh, parts. So I want to focus Shira, on- yeah. Shira, just a reminder of the time, maybe you can try to wrap up in about two minutes. Yes, yeah. Uh, so the agricultural policy making in India is quite fraught with a lot of contradictions. Uh, we, on the one hand, we have legacy problems. We have a procurement policy and fertilizer subsidies that we have inherited from the Green Revolution era. We are still struggling with that. But it's also a bundle of contradictions where you promote organic farming on the one hand with large subsidies for chemical fertilizers. You promote smallholder dairy with a ban on cow slaughter. And you have export promotion policies, but you ban exports uh, without any warning. Um, there's also, and this is something that conforms to what Amitabh said, is a recent trend towards centralization, which is quite disconnected from local uh, needs and issues. And the complete breakdown of center state coordination, which is very imperative when you talk about problems like climate change. Um, this is my uh, last slide, just a bunch of takeaways. Um, we are going to, I anticipate that we are going to be a nation of smallholders where laborers, it's, it's going to be peasants who are actually more, look more like labor households. So it's going to be landed labor with pluri activities. Agriculture is not going to go away from their livelihood portfolios. And historically, we've focused on solving the problem of agriculture se sector by relying on the non-farm sector to absorb uh, farmers uh, or former farmers. And my submission is that we need to focus on agriculture sector as is a sector that can generate employment and sustainable livelihoods. Um, the third point I want to make is technology cannot independently solve its problems, nor can economic policy. The two are uh, very linked but often it's uh, driven by efficiency goals. And I feel that we need to have environmental and uh, social sustainability as guiding principles. The fourth point is that Indian agriculture is too diverse to, for it to be uh, dealt with in a centralized way. It demands local action. And I want to flag the role of civil society that has been doing incredible work in the area of climate change adaptation and food security. Uh, in short, I believe we should have a pragmatic approach to accommodate plural agricultures. And uh, that, that's a huge challenge uh, and it's going to be slow, but uh, I think gradual, I'm an advocate of gradualism, which offers scope for course correction rather than big bang and magic bullet efforts. So I'll stop there and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sura. That was, that was uh, such a clear, important uh, contribution. The, 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 the lack of, again, back in, 20, in, in 1947, people would not have expected it at, at, in 2021 to be having this, uh, the, the, this discussion, uh, the, the, the lack of trans, uh, transformation. And, 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 and so importantly, is that, that your emphasis, this is the reality that it is. It needs a, it needs a policies that are, that are both suited to that context, take into account the new challenges. Uh, uh, and, and, and these need to be context specific uh, policies and, and, and involve stakeholders in a civil society, which, which of course Amitabh commented on it as well. So, so thank you very much for, uh, for that. Uh, there are questions coming in. Please continue to add those and, and we'll try to, if, if possible, uh, uh, organize this in the discussion. But before we get there, of course, uh, last in, uh, in, in our, our uh, wonderful panel is, uh, is, uh, is, is Yamini Ayar, um, who needs very little uh, in, introduction, uh, I believe. Uh, she is, uh, of course, the, the president and CEO of the Center for Policy Research in New Delhi. Uh, she's worked for uh, uh, many Indian as well as international organizations, including the World Bank Ford Foundation. I, I, I follow her closely on social media, and, and I'm so happy to, in, to, to to, to introduce her as the last uh, speaker on this panel. Yamini, the floor is yours. 
Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me to this wonderful discussion and giving me the toughest task uh, there is of uh, now uh, having to think of something uh, more profound and newer to say than my two wonderful <laughs> panelists that spoke before me. So apologies, I don't think I'll be able to live up to that task. Uh, I, I, I may well end up repeating uh, what a lot of, uh, 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 of what Sudha and Amitabh have said. Um, so with that, um, I was tasked uh, to think about um, what uh, an inclusive Indian economy or economic policy could look like in 2047. Um, and much like uh, Amitabh and uh, Sudha, uh, my starting point uh, is somewhat more, somewhat pessimistic. In fact, it's deeply pessimistic um, and also um, recognizes the many deep uncertainties in which we find ourselves uh, today in 2021. I think a decade or so ago, uh, had we had this conversation, uh, the tone and tenor of how each one of us would have approached this question would have been remarkably different. Because I think we stand at a particularly critical juncture today, where fundamental foundational uh, accepted certainties about India, uh, even as those certainties may well have been shaky on occasion, uh, but all of those certainties combined look far shakier today uh, than they did even a decade ago. Uh, and I'll emphasize four, uh, but while focusing specifically on, on two. Um, uh, the, the foundational pillars of India, a liberal constitutional order, uh, a commitment uh, towards uh, deepening political democracy, uh, a commitment towards social inclusion, uh, and an expectation and anticipation of growth. Uh, these were four foundational pillars on which the India story uh, was built, and particularly in the last uh, post-1991 narrative of India, this was what was distinctive about India's growth and India's developmental model, uh, shaky as it may have been in some areas, but the aspiration was clear. Um, Amitabh spoke about uh, the uncertainties of our com political commitment to a liberal constitutional order and the very deep vulnerabilities in our political democracy. Uh, I won't emphasize those more than to say I completely endorse everything that Amitabh said and Sudha spoke about this as well. There are some elements of democracy that remain strong and robust uh, and really it is uh, the, the mantle of holding on to our democracy today rests far more firmly with civil society than it does with our mainstream party politics. And that battle will continue and hopefully be won by civil society. But let me focus a little bit on the two other pillars, social inclusion and growth. Again, we touched on these in both the presentations earlier. But I want to start by sort of emphasizing some of the very significant uncertainties that we confront today. Um, in the following ways. I think the narrative of India's growth, uh, or rather the expectation that India will continue to see positive growth over time, uh, and in the 2000s, the hope that that growth will uh, expand itself or reorient itself towards a focus on inclusive growth, uh, are no longer um, certainties. Uh, before the pandemic, uh, the Indian economy was already seeing a, a significant slowdown. And I would argue, and that's uh, the theme of, of what I want to emphasize, is that the reason we saw slowdown, uh, we saw the economy slow down, there are many uh, specific factors that contributed to that slowdown. Uh, but the big picture challenge was that we didn't actually have a robust, inclusive, structural imagination of where the economy needed to go in order that all Indians become active participants in economic opportunity. We focused specifically on growth. We did not focus on economic opportunity. That had presented itself with uh, a context where inequality was widening. Amitabh spoke about this uh, as well. Uh, but just one figure uh, to give you a sense of how deeply significant uh, the, the inequality challenge is, the share of total wealth of the, of the top 10, 1% of the population increased from 12 
1981 to 42.5% in 2020, um, but the share of wealth of the bottom half, 50% uh, in fact dropped as a percentage of total uh, national income. So to give you a sense of how deep uh, inequality is in, Indi in India, and it's not just a factor of eventual uh, initial divergence to eventual convergence, you compare the Indian economy with China and you see that the, 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 the inequality, structural inequality is far deeper here. But this structural inequality was also reflecting itself uh, in, in an aborted structural transformation. I think Sudha uh, spoke of the complexity uh, of India's structural transformation, but what has been important about India in the last two, two to three years, uh, but, well, last year pre-COVID and then COVID of course exacerbated all of this, is that we in fact saw a reversal back into agriculture um, as was evident from the latest periodic labor force uh, uh, surveys. Um, so growth, equity, um, and structural transformation, or, or, a, or a pathway towards structural transformation, all that were accepted uh, certainties for India, slow, sputtering, but certainties. Today in 2021, as we think to, uh, forward towards 2020, 2047, don't look uh, as certain as they did even a decade ago. India's demographic dividend, uh, the great hope that would lead us to a strong path uh, towards uh, 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 economic growth. Uh, I would argue today looks like a demographic ticking time bomb. A ticking time bomb because we didn't, as Amita pointed out, invest effectively in health. Uh, we also failed entirely to invest effectively in education. We managed to some degree to universalize access, but we completely failed on outcomes. Uh, so even before the pandemic, uh, 50% of children in standard five can barely read a standard two text. India today sits on uh, what is the world's longest school closure. Uh, primary schools are not open in a large part of the country. It's been over 21 months. Uh, digital access is uh, uh, is limited, uh, so uh, a large proportion of India students have not seen the inside of a school or not had any schooling uh, for these last 21 months. The learning loss is huge. And we, honest to God, do not have a plan for what this is going to do. Uh, I suspect a whole generation and more of students are going to deeply suffer as a consequence. India's formal and informal economy, uh, which is also at the heart of what we expected for our structural transformation, the informal economy will eventually formalize. We haven't quite figured out the pathway. But what's particularly worrying today is that the formal economy has expanded and COVID has support has enabled uh, that uh, in no small measure. The informal economy has shrunk, uh, not because the informal is transitioning to formal, but because the informal has now been invisibilized even more. Our ability to invest and strengthen in medium and small enterprises and transition medium and small enterprises in towards the formal economy, despite various efforts like the goods and services tax, which were billed as efforts to to formalize in an economy have failed significantly. We, we today sit on a, uh, a, labor mark, uh, a, a labor regulatory regime that supports neither labor nor capital. Uh, and every time we seek to reform it, we end up trying to support more capital, but fail at doing that too, uh, lending itself to an extremely complex regulatory regime that helps nobody uh, and only undermines possibilities. The last of the uncertainties we confront uh, links to the complex 21st century transitions that we face, the transitions uh, that we face linked to technology, the transitions that we face linked to climate change, all of which mean that the old imagination of uh, transformation from farm to non-farm, urbanization, manufacturing, uh, the linearity of those transitions no longer seem clear. The East Asian model of exporting your way to prosperity in an, uh, in an environment of deglobalization also no longer seem clear, uh, all of which combine to exacerbate the uncertainties uh, in India's growth story, um, and also highlight the fact that we need to think very differently and very creatively uh, of what our our growth pathway could and should in fact look like. And this is where I'll come to the second part of my talk, which is thinking through what this could be. I believe that uh, India's growth narrative will only build itself uh, uh, in a progressive direction, one that, one that emphasizes 
uh, inclusion and underplays the fault lines that uh, our growth story of the last 30 years um, actually highlighted is one uh, that builds on a new imagination. And I offer a few starting points of how to think about this. The first element of this new imagination has to be a very different understanding of markets and the relationship between state and markets. The narrative of India in 1991, perhaps coming off uh, the license Raj, uh, was a narrative of getting the state out of the way, a narrative which saw the state as an impediment, uh, rightly so, I think, uh, in more ways than one, um, but saw the answer as one of getting the state out of the way. India sleeps at, uh, uh, India grows at night while the state sleeps. Uh, Gurcharandas' infamous uh, quip uh, in many ways uh, epitomized the imagination of the 1991 moment, an imagination that continues, I think, in no small way. And we saw this uh, in the farm laws to shape how we think of states, how we think of markets, and how we think uh, of uh, making markets work for the poor. What we know in 2021, especially after the last uh, 10 decades post the global financial crisis, uh, that, that an imagination for making markets work that emphasizes de -like deregulation without adequately emphasizing building state capacity for regulation in the right way and the right form lends itself to an environment where crony capitalism inevitably wins. The predatory and coercive instinct of the state uh, is always significant, uh, and the ability of the predatory instincts of the market to combine hands and join forces with the predatory instincts of the state are, are, are significant. So what we saw in, the, in that 1991 phase, without investing effectively in regulatory uh, in the regulatory infrastructure of the state uh, was a sort of two-phase capitalism, occasional dynamism, uh, but deep predatory instincts unfolding, lending itself to the crony capitalism that has under that that has in many ways and rightly so uh, built a deep distrust amongst the bulk of Indians in what the markets can do. Uh, I again think that this was very much reflected in the mobilization around the farm laws, uh, where the fear of corporatization was not because the farmers were captured by the left necessarily. Many of the elite farmers were, are, do not necessarily speak the grammar of the left. It is because there's genuine lack of trust on the ability of the of free market minus the state effectively regulating it to protect interests uh, of players in the market. Don't forget that we are talking about markets in the context of deep structural and spatial inequality and deep information asymmetry. So the language we need to adopt is one that understands better what is the nature of state investment needed to make markets genuinely work. This means that there is a need for state investments in physical market infrastructure, in incentivizing supply chains, in managing risk, in enhancing bargaining power. It means that the state needs to carefully understand what it takes to build regulatory infrastructure. That means also thinking through the human resources and basic capacities needed to strengthen uh, regulatory infrastructure and how to balance transparency to ensure that regulation works. The second element of what we Yamini, need to think about. Yeah. Yamini, sorry, a reminder of time if you yeah, can. I, I will, I will stop in, in, in three and a half minutes. Uh, the second element of what we need to reframe our imaginations of growth paths is to break binaries that we have conceptualized of where and how we can think about growth. It is quite stunning that a country where, which is as deeply dependent on agriculture as India is, has looked to growth uh, without actively understanding the rural economy. It always has built an imagination of growth that wants to move rural into urban without understanding the complex interlinkages between rural and urban. In fact, the bulk of urbanization takes place as rural economies transform, which means the investments that we need to make have to be investments in those interlinkages. 
But if you just look at how we structure our interface uh, from the policy uh, uh, framework, we have an urban development ministry, we have a micro, small and medium enterprise department, we have a rural development ministry, we have an agricultural development ministry, we across center and states, we do not recognize regional interconnections, spatial interconnections, and the centrality, in fact, of the old socialist version of planning. I'm not arguing for socialist planning, but I am arguing for planning. You cannot expect markets to work without effectively building a regional imagination that invests in interlinkages that enable markets to work and enable the possibilities of building opportunities. This means that our federal infrastructure needs to be strengthened deeply. As the Indian economy has got more complex, uh, states and the center, our markets have become much more integrated. And this creates new kinds of tensions. Uh, spatial divergence, spatial inequality is vast in India. Uh, the expectation, and this is another significantly unique aspect of India's growth, the expectation that eventually you will see convergence 30 years after liberalization hasn't in fact worked. Uh, spatial inequality is significant. And again, we saw this in, its in, in the most uh, violent of forms during the lockdown, where you saw the movement of labor from production, from producing states uh, to, to poorer states from where where labor supply comes. We are an integrated market, but we're also a differentiated market, which means states and center need to work in a much more coordinated fashion. And this tendency of our politics to centralize undermines the possibilities of this deep coordination and deeply diverse and decentralized approach to planning and development and growth that we genuinely need. Last and not least, perhaps the most important, we had an economic imagination that uh, prided itself on the assumption that growth, uh, uh, there are trade-offs between investments in growth and investments in welfare. In fact, the uh, growth is constitutive of welfare. Uh, again, something that COVID it has brought out in the sharpest of relief. Investments in welfare are cru crucial, but in order for us to invest effectively in welfare, we need to shed our disenchantment in the state's ability to deliver. The state's ability to deliver basic health and education. We see in our politics today an expanding welfare state, expanding in the form of direct benefit transfers, cash to uh, all kinds of beneficiary groups that are politically relevant to electoral play, but we do not see a robust effective investment in pure public goods, and most importantly, in health and education. That is left to an imagination of something the state should perhaps finance, but cannot actually deliver on, leaving it to God and markets to deliver on. No country in the world has progressed or grown without deep investments in basic human capital. Ultimately, that's the foundation, and that's where we need to go. So my closing point if India is to develop a new pathway of growth for 2047, the 1991 imagination of getting the state out of the way has to give way to a 2047 imagination of a strong, robust, capable, not predatory, not coercive, but inclusive, participatory, and democratic state. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Yamini. This is such a rich uh, contribution, and I definitely hope in, in, in the discussion we can come back to it. I don't think I've ever heard that expression, but the problem we face is it's a free market minus the state. That, that, that is a core to that problem, and, and that, that's so closely linked to, 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 to the models of democracy, of course, and the point you're making about kinds of regulation and investment in, in public goods is so important. Before we Go back to that, perhaps. I, I, I would love to, and there's two questions that, that touch on this. Love to hear a little bit more about the sustainability side, the climate side. One of the questions in the, uh, in the chat uh, was, uh, was around uh, um, growing water shortages. And maybe we turn to Shuda first to, to kind of deepen, to, to say a little bit more about how new climate challenges are, uh, are, are impacting to put your picture of what, what has happened and what might happen, because these climate problems will likely not get, uh, not get less. Um, so around the issue of water shortage, and also there was a question, I believe it was from Copic, that uh, in, in, in that in that context, what does, what does, it's, it's a broad question, I realize, but what does a model of green growth look like, and particularly decentralized, we're assuming these models should be decentralized, uh, what, what should these models look like? So maybe 
we start with uh, with with Sudan and then see if Amitabh and Yamani want to add anything on on broadly how the uh, what I think is a growing growing climate crisis internationally as well as in any country uh, how does that this uh, uh, impact the pi your picture? Yeah, uh, thank you and thanks for the question. Uh, with regard to water, I uh, I think the source of the problem are several. Uh, one is uh, what uh, what was caused by policies. So if you look at a lot of groundwater uh, extraction, uh, we have uh, power subsidies, so uh, free power in many states. Uh, likewise, we've never really metered electricity to agriculture or metered uh, water consumption other than in a few states. And one of these, uh, uh, the problems with uh, India's uh, we, we, are very, uh, we are very good with adding new policies, but it's been very hard to remove policies that have already been put in place. Um, now we also have the danger where with solar energy pump sets, we have this uh, threat of further groundwater uh, extraction. Now there are innovative solutions. Uh, many of them are politically difficult. For example, with solar pumps, Selling electricity to the grid is, uh, by farmers is one option where you're incentivizing uh, uh, limited irrigation rather than uh, uh, irresponsible use of water. Uh, but there are others that uh, like free, uh, free electricity and uh, free water, it's, it's, it's very hard for state governments to do. Uh, and I think this is one of the tough issues with policy uh, and uh, a lot of the Mature and green revolution areas actually have a problem of over extraction of groundwater. Uh, now there's another set of problems that's coming precisely from diversification. So our notion is that paddy weed systems are inimical to uh, water supplies and because it, it, it comes together with this package of uh, irrigation and power subsidies. But what we are finding in highly commercialized regions, especially such as Maharashtra, where intensification to grow horticulture crops for the market has also reached unsustainable water uh, level use. So uh, you see people actually exploiting water resources in order to make uh, profits in the short term. So that's a very different set of, uh, there, there's absolutely no incentive to conserve water and policy has very little to do with it. Um, and uh, I, I think it's hard to predict. Uh, and then there's, of course, this uh, unknowns uh, coming from climate change. Uh, personally, I don't really work on water, uh, but I think a lot of it is about creating awareness and an incentive structure and a focus on sustainability. So, and there are many efforts, again, at the local level, this probably answers uh, Mr. Gopi's question as well. Um, that we, what we are seeing is district level initiatives by enlightened uh, district level administration combined with uh, civil society actors and now increasingly farmer organizations. And I think it is, uh, I don't know exactly what it will look like because that's not really my area of research, but you do see these initiatives happening. And I would say that while we argue for state level agricultural policy, I think we really have to look at climate change adaptability strategies at the district level and even uh, beyond to block level and uh, mm -hmm. panchayat level because mm -hmm. a lot of the adaptation strategies and the implementation of those and the cooperation that you need is going to happen at a very, very local level. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, turning to Amitabh in, in a second, but just to uh, should have mentioned it a little earlier. If, if please continue to ask questions in the uh, chat function, and also uh, we can open up the floor for for spoken comments. There is at the bottom, if I'm not mistaken, at the bottom of your screen, there's a button as reactions, and within that there's an, a possibility to, uh, to, to raise your hand. So, so as we're going to back to two to, to speakers, uh, please let us know what, what, when you would like to intervene and we can open that up. Um, Amitabh, do you want to follow up on, on that? I, I think your comments on, you know, on, on the need for civil society uh, 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 participation in that was very clear on the lines with Shuda is saying uh, in, in the context of growing climate challenging and the need to respond to climate change. What, what, the, what does this look like? Are there any examples uh, 
uh, where this where this is work is working or can work. <clears throat> So this, this is a tough one for me, but from my work, what I can say is that the challenge is growing many fold pretty much every year. And this I can say from the work that we do on, on disasters, as, as you know, Oxfam does uh, a humanitarian piece. So I'm told by my humanitarian team that uh, our work uh, was uh, five years ago much smaller, the portfolio is much smaller than what we have. And in the last one year, we've been uh, responding. We did respond to COVID. We have responded to Kerala, Uttarakhand. At the moment, I'm looking at a situation report for Andhra. So the number of disasters have grown immensely. And, and we are completely stretched now. And it is very clear that while we work also with communities that the livelihoods are getting affected. And, and that's where I think we are working on resilient livelihoods. Uh, we are, as Sudha was saying, you know, we are trying to do this certainly in Odessa to work with panchayats to look at a uh, panchayat level disaster management plan. But these are still early days. There is in terms of the policy framing, uh, every state, does talk of even a panchayat level uh, uh, disaster management plan. But uh, we work in, in six or seven states intensively, uh, but it's in, only in Orissa where we've been able to actually work with panchayats and start uh, working on it. Yeah, thanks. Th th thanks. Before I turn to, to Yamini, what, what, you know, there was, of course, there's been a lot of talk about building back better and the idea that that, that, that crises kind of unlock Political institutional blockages over over the last year. Have you have you seen that happening at all? The the building back back better is is what you're saying. Yeah, and particularly in the context of 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 COVID, which was a national, international, and a national crisis, or or any of those climate uh, uh, th th those disasters happening. So I, I would say that uh, that's not even a rhetoric that we use. Right. Uh, uh, very often there is at least empty rhetoric, but I've not seen this as a rhetoric. We have not even made uh, uh, any fundamental change in terms of how we look at health, for instance, right. Uh, right. post COVID. And there were so many government committees telling the government, for instance, just to talk about the most uh, vivid uh, experience that we had around uh, oxygen. Uh, there were commissions which told the government that we needed much greater oxygen supply, but mm -hmm. we did not address that. You look at uh, the Ayushman Bharat, the result has been very poor. A lot of people have not been able to access Ayushman Bharat, uh, but we have not seen any fundamental changes. So building back better, you know, at the moment, you know, as, as I'm saying, I might sound pessimistic, but it's about building back worse is what we're looking at. And, and it is so evident in the way uh, the India story is unfolding. I, I, and I did talk about it. Thanks. Yamani, before we get back to, to, to the market states and regulation questions and anything you'd like to deepen your analysis and, and um, kind of your forward-looking comments uh, related to a growing climate crisis as it exists internationally and in India? I think, uh, well, I guess there are two parts to it. I think, um, you know, in, in at, at some level in the India is also at an important crossroad in terms of the kinds of uh, pathways it chooses to adopt. Uh, you know, there is, despite all the uncertainties, uh, there is once there is in all likelihood uh, one certainty that our energy needs are going to grow. 
um, uh, if if nothing else, because that small proportion of the formal economy is beginning to look better and better, as we can see post COVID. Uh, but you know, less pessimistically, uh, there is we, we are definitely on a forward path, and we do have to make very crucial choices uh, around what uh, pathways of energy transitions we want to lock ourselves into. I think the global uh, play uh, and the global power play uh, has placed us in a place where we are willing to look at uh, renewables seriously, um, but we haven't quite fully uh, figured out how we need to balance our growing energy needs with generating more capacity for coal versus renewables. And you see some of those confusions in, in, in the political positioning, global positioning uh, that India presented even at COP26. Uh, and of course, there is this larger question of global equity around financing. But I do think that at a broad policy level, there's some recognition of the centrality of uh, thinking about this for India uh, domestically as well. But the real uh, tipping point is going to be on whether we have the state institutions to actually develop the appropriate pathways and build together. So both Sudha and Amitabh spoke about the centrality of local governments. Um, the latest finance commission for urban local governments has allocated some specific funds to look at climate resilience uh, and climate adaptation, air pollution, environmental aspects locked into a certain kind of funding. Um, but I think that it's at uh, the discourse on uh, the institutional capability to actually manage to navigate the challenges that climate presents us is, is at a very, very nascent stage. Um, and, and uh, you know, even the ability uh, at a policy level to project what our carbon trajectory is going to look like parallel to our growth trajectory uh, needs a lot more investment and strengthening. So we are a long way away, but I do think we've recognized the problem and that's perhaps a starting point. Um, I did want to just add uh, while endorsing Amitabh's point about uh, are building back better, uh, or rather not building back at all, because we haven't acknowledged any of the, fall, the, the challenges that COVID presented us with. In fact, we've probably regressed uh, along with the Indian economy back uh, a few miles. What we did try to do uh, through the crisis uh, was to uh, legitimize the narrative that crisis is opportunity. And it is in this opportunity that we need to push through a set of reforms that will push uh, the Indian economy further. The farm laws were an important example of precisely that. I think we've seen in the act of repealing those farm laws an important recognition and corrective to the broad narrative of economic growth in India, that reform by stealth or crisis and opportunity, reform that doesn't take uh, those who are impacted with by reforms, particularly as we are now dealing with more complex factor markets uh, that affect people's everyday lives, is not the appropriate path forward. And that hopefully is a lesson that some of our politics will take on. Thanks, thanks very much, Sage. I mean, as you were speaking, there was a, and maybe we stick, I think your best place to answer this, uh, this question. Um, if others want to comment, of course, feel, feel free to do so. Uh, the question came from uh, Andrea, Andrea Khan. Could the speakers, if I'm just reading it out, could the speakers give greater clarity on the relevance of the four labor codes being rationalized, simplified in 2021, uh, related to industrial relations, way to social security, occupation and uh, health and safety? How, how, how do you see those? How can we see those in, in the context of inclusive growth? And, and I think, as, as Andre also points out, it, it, it's closely linked to the question of the farm laws, isn't it? I think so a few things um one you know india's informal economy has long been invisible to uh policy uh, and in fact to our growth discourse we ignore it we also don't collect data on it we have broad numbers on it um, and uh, it remains hidden even now but it found a way to make itself uh, uh, extremely visible in a moment of crisis uh, the first lockdown that the indian government imposed in march 2020 uh, the the uh, the images of uh, workers from cities uh, walking home uh, down the highways uh, was perhaps the most emblematic image of the Indian lockdown uh, and highlighted the extent of vulnerability and informality, uh, vulnerability be generated because of informality in the Indian economy. Uh, the expectation was uh, that a crisis like this 
uh, would potentially highlight uh, the importance of robust social security uh, and of uh, building um, genuine organic pathways towards uh, bridging from informality to formality that protects workers. Uh, the reality is that we never quite got there. In fact, the informal economy shrunk even further uh, as the formal economy expanded and India's economic recovery is entirely on the back of a profit-led recovery where market share is being taken by big corporates and listed companies away from informal companies because they were able to adjust better to demands uh, uh, in the context of, um, of, of COVID. Uh, and they also recognized that they could cut costs uh, and and generate profit. Um, at the same time, uh, this crisis is an opportunity, gave the space for uh, the re-emergence of a long-held reality uh, of labor market, which is we have complex regulation, uh, we have poorly implemented regulation, and therefore a lot of regulatory uncertainty that supports neither capital nor labor. Uh, uh, Manish Sabarwal has a phrase uh, which uh, he uses often, which has also become part of the policy narrative called regulatory cholesterol. Uh, there's a large number of regulation, uh, which makes it difficult for companies, uh, firms to grow, which uh, incentive, which creates perverse incentives for firms, in fact, to remain informal and remain small. Uh, and the crisis was seen as a grand opportunity to undo all of this cholesterol, but undo it entirely in favor of capital, not labor, given that the vulnerabilities of labor were very visible, you can see which way the political discourse was going. So uh, barely a month after uh, the horrific images of workers going home mm -hmm. uh, and the failure of the state towards these workers, uh, you saw several states trying to reform labor laws, which in fact uh, extended work hours, removed safety protections such as they were in the laws. The labor codes then, uh, these four labor codes that you're talking about were in the works for some time. Some of them were sensible, but they needed a lot more debate and discussion. In the parliamentary session of September 2020, uh, just as the farm bills were bulldozed with absolutely no parliamentary discussion, so were the labor codes. Um, and uh, they were completely different to what was presented to the standing committee and what was debated in the parliamentary processes or standards of standing committees. Um, and the expectation was that state governments would align uh, and all of this would be implemented on the 1st of April. Uh, some of the advantages of federalism are that uh, when things don't quite work, state governments can actually uh, slow processes down. So those labor codes have still not been, uh, states have still not issued their rules, codification has not happened. Will this open up the space for a more serious discourse on what appropriate labor codes should be like, ones that allow capital to function, but at the same time protect labor? That's the big question. Our politics is not leading us there. Hopefully, civil society and public discourse will. Thanks very much. It's a horrific picture there of a regulatory cholesterol itself is hard enough. Re regulatory cholesterol, I never heard that. That's like an awful image comes to uh, comes to mind. Th th thanks, thanks for, for that, and, and, and thanks for putting this 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 debate, contextualizing this debate on uh, on, on on ideas or not of, of rebuilding through uh, through a pandemic. Uh, Amitabh, any any comments perhaps on the uh, on the labor uh, labor quotes, or you feel it's sufficiently covered? It's, 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 it's been covered sufficiently, but maybe just to add emotion to it, uh, you know, as, as Yamni said, it, 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 she's responded to the question, but in terms of the emotion, I think what's very critical is to go back to the images that Yamni talked of, mm -hmm. where you're looking at people walking back in 42 degrees, 43 degrees, uh, thousands of kilometers, often barefoot, uh, no food and water. And that's the time when we completely failed our uh, working class. Yep. That's the time we reverse the rights that labor have won uh, through decades of battles, maybe actually centuries. And we just were taking it away without any debate, without any conversation. So I, I think that's, that's something very critical and we need to highlight that. That probably reflects uh, the health of, of this democracy and also the intent of the state. And I, I think 
the the way Yamni put it. Uh, I was talking of the predatory state, but it's about the predatory state and the predatory market aligning, and and and, and that's that's what I, I I thought was something very important to underscore. Just gonna add, sorry, just a very quick two finger on this, which is the the one thing that uh, COVID highlighted most significantly related to informal workers and uh, and labor protection is a complete lack of robust social protection for uh -huh. workers in urban India uh, and the absence of portability of rights. Uh, uh -huh. And uh, we have had a lot of talk of one nation, one Russian card, but nothing more uh, beyond that. And in fact, in the 2020 21 budget, uh, national budget, social protection budgets were slashed uh, in perhaps the expectation that we were past the pandemic and all was well, and the consequences are visible in the form of, uh, in fact, increased poverty in India. Thank you so much both, and, and thank you for, for adding that, uh, Amitabh. For me, uh, similar, and I, I come as a, as a student of Indian labor history, I compared that to, to what uh, the the colonial records said about economic crisis, for example, in 1931, where 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 the solution to the economic crisis were, were workers basically going uh, going back home, and and that that has not changed one bit as far as I can see. There's hardly or none at all of those rights. Plus, what struck me was like this was such a and and such a recipe for that pandemic to spread into the fastest possible. It didn't actually happen. But it could have been so far worse, right? We had no idea how the pandemic was spreading, and 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 those poor laborers is going back, a crowded trains. If there was, if if they were there, it was like the a complete neglect of the public health aspect of that as well, uh, which 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 is awful to uh, to see. We're we're almost out of time. I'm going to speak. Um, last round, perhaps uh, uh, a quick round of, of one minute of of of. of thoughts and, and and the one perhaps might be you thought maybe i like put you know what is your, your your one last minute you want to want to leave us with but but perhaps you can also and this is you know this is a, a circle is a um a, a venue that promotes exchange of, of research and thoughts you know what are the kind of things that we should be focusing on uh, going forward as a research community as an international research community i know that's a tough task but should i be you want to Last comments, one uh, one minute. Any thoughts? Sure. So can I can I go for? Go ahead, please go ahead. Yeah. So you know, we we've, we've been really wondering, as an I I certainly work with a lot of activists, that uh, this is not India specific, uh, in terms of the regime that we are looking at. So how does popular protest work? And we are looking at a moment where in many ways, the, the idea of representative democracy is, is in deep crisis. And, and you have the same story starting from Trump, fortunately, we have seen his back, but you go to Brazil, to Turkey, to Russia, to Philippines, you have very similar strong men at the moment. So what is the kind of popular mobilization? What is the, uh, the work that civil society could do to reaffirm faith in, in participatory democracy, in substantive democracy? So that's, that's a question, as in we are struggling. It's, it's, uh, everybody's trying to work on it, but ideas from the academic world would be very, very helpful to see how how uh, what what lies ahead to rebuild democracy even the normative consensus around human rights on social justice it's all shattered uh, so so how do we rebuild that is really the the big question thanks thanks very much uh, excellent uh, shuda yeah, I, I, I don't think it's an easy question to answer. No. <laughs> uh, I think on the face of it, uh, Canadian agriculture and Indian agriculture are like poles apart. At the same time, uh, I think there are overarching similarities and uh, the trajectory that Canada took in terms of uh, the retreat of the state from procurement, as well as these large cooperatives uh, and the challenges of uh, accessing land and uh, getting into farming, especially of the non-industrial variety, 
are all things that uh, interestingly india seems to have not gone the whole way but has just started plugging into the new innovations already that are happening in canada so i think there especially on the technology institutions front i think there is a large uh, area of uh, research and learning that's feasible um, i also think that in terms of uh, so sort of um, more empirical work um, as i said india is so large there's so much going on in different contexts um, that uh, we don't have enough researchers uh, in fact to to go into these and even document what's going on and as an agricultural economist i'm always told that uh, you're one of the few in your generation who do agricultural economics because the fact is the way economics is done now has changed a lot it's dominated by randomized controlled trials and there are no longer subject experts and field experts so you have economists who work on agriculture but not really agricultural economists and i think that tradition is very much alive in uh, in uh, uh, canada as well as uh, uh, the interdisciplinarity of approaches and collaborations and i think that's somewhat weak in indian academics even today so i think that is again an um, an uh, Uh, an area worth exploring sorry that was longer than uh, you wanted but uh, yeah i i, I, I think that was that. a question that deserved more than a minute but we don't have the minute anymore yamini would you like to, could you could you help us wrap up i want to make a quick announcement before uh, before we have to close thank you so much for that two very quick things what 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 one more pointed and the other open ended i think that india's uh, e uh, economic trajectory is also at an important juncture linked to a federal trajectory uh, mm -hmm. and there is a lot that we can learn uh, about the fed uh, the the nature of federal dynamics uh, from canada uh, about how uh, central governments and subnational governments have addressed questions of divergence through performance grants etc so, so many of the technicalities of building strong fiscal federal uh, systems uh, uh, have a there, there's a lot that india can learn and a lot of indian uh, 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 public finance economists look to these questions and canada often comes up but we don't know enough so i think that's an area where uh, which is ripe for a lot more research and a lot more comparative work that can feed directly into policy i think a second big question uh, that confronts not just india but the globe which is around how you can create equitable markets and if and and um, an effective state engagement in uh, creating an enabling environment where both the state and markets check effectively each other's predatory instincts i don't think there is any such thing as a perfect answer to this both are by definition complex and predatory but how best to create an an environment in which predatory instincts can be effectively checked is a question for us to explore because cronyism is rife across all uh democratic societies so democracy in and of itself may not be the best check but we need to strengthen parts of democracy to make them effective checks so those relationships need to be better understood thank you so much it may not be the best check but it's then you know we can't do without it either right so we Absolutely. need to strengthen, to strengthen some forms of it's not not one form but but forms of democracy thank you thank you so much thank you so much to our three uh, speakers uh, thank you so much to the audience for the questions thank you amita uh, uh, yamini uh, for your time to to share those thoughts with us um it is the first i or it is part of a, a series on democracy in india 2047 um and um that the and i want to make Uh, mentioned that uh, one uh, all this information is on the circle website uh, which i think is canada india research.ca but maybe sharada you can you can post that just to make sure we have the right one uh, but you can certainly find it under circle at the university of guelph um, and the next event will be correct me if i'm wrong uh, uh, sharada <clears throat> on wednesday the 5th of january so early in the next uh, the next year it will be at the same time and and it will be again a fantastic panel i think closely following up on many of the questions around democracy and and representation uh, with niraj kopal jayal uh, yogendra yadav and uh, and nafshran singh so i i certainly very much look forward to the next one and with that again to the speakers thank you so much for your time and your uh, inputs uh, and and to everybody stay well and and hope to see you soon thank you thank you bye bye
拜。